So welcome everyone, and uh, uh, this is the, the inaugural webinar for the Tobacco Center for Regulatory Science. Uh, I'm really thankful that uh, Dr. Pahacek uh, agreed to, to do this. Um, and uh, let's let's move on with the presentation. Uh, next, please. So just a little bit of background about the uh, the T course. Um, we were funded in uh, September 2013, uh, one of 14 centers in the United States. Dr. Cheryl Perry is the uh, the principal investigator for the Texas site, um, and there's 13 other funded centers. The NIH funded us to provide scientific evidence and and to develop a, a new generation of tobacco regulatory sciences scientists to help guide regulatory actions taken by the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration has the authority in 2009 uh, to regulate the manufacturing, distribution, and marketing of tobacco products. Next, next please, Brooks. So the mission of our uh, Texas t Core Center is uh, uh, we, we felt that Texas is a bellwether state, and what that means is the demography of Texas is uh, uh, slowly but surely uh, representing the demography of the entire United States. So we, we think that what's happening in Texas today is what the U.S. is going to look like in the future. And we chose to work uh, and look specifically at youth and young adults as a vulnerable population because you know, tobacco is a, a two-sided sword. There's uh, uh, smokers who are currently addicted to tobacco, and then there's children who are not addicted. So we, we, we focused on the youth and young adults and the prevention of uh, addiction to nicotine and to tobacco. And in doing so, we, we, we wanted to take a, a hard look at new and emerging tobacco products, products like e-cigarettes, products like hookahs, products like little, little cigars, uh, and look at the marketing strategies uh, that are used to uh, entice youth to try tobacco, try it enough so that they become addicted themselves. Um, and we're also in this center uh, looking at communication methods to inform young adults about the risks and harms of tobacco use U using new media strategies such as text messaging and uh, other social media sites. Next, Brooks, please. So we've got three, three what's called R01 research projects. They're uh, full-blown uh, um, research projects looking at uh, youth and young adults and, and trying to to determine what it is that they're experiencing in the advertising of tobacco products, uh, what are the things, the triggers for, for getting them to, to try tobacco, and, and hopefully all of this information then can go to the FDA to help uh, dissuade youth to, to trying tobacco or new tobacco products in the first place, and to give the FDA new information to make uh, the best possible regulations that they can. Um, we've got four cores within the center, a training, development, a data, core and administrative core. So we have a, a number of resources here in Texas. Um, and I am the manager of the training core, which is why I'm speaking today. We put on a, a speaker series annually. Now, our invited speaker this year was uh, Dr. Pahacek. He, he gave a really great lecture yesterday. Uh, and that also will be put up online um, uh, probably next week. Uh, in addition, we thought, well, let's do a webinar too while he's here. So it's, it's really nice for him to give two talks for us. Um, so look forward to future speaking uh, series uh, in the fall uh, of every year while we're here. And uh, as far as webinars go, we're going to try to do one, one per month is our goal. Uh, so if you learned about this webinar, obviously someone sent you an email, and we'll, we'll be sending out emails and other announcements too. Uh, have a look regularly at the, uh, the Michael and Susan Dell Center uh, for Healthy Living website, and you'll see about future attractions that we do not just on tobacco, but on, uh, on obesity um, and physical activity, many other things which are related to children and youth. Um, I, I also must mention that we have partners in the, uh, the Texas T-Core site uh, for our project, and the uh, UT School of Public Health, obviously, is where we're sitting right now, but also UT Austin is a good partner, and they're managing uh, one of the R01 projects, and UT MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, as well, both uh, Texas organizations, and then uh, Rutgers, um, out on the East Coast. So, next please. So let me just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Tepere Pahacek. I assume you're, you're, you're here listening to him because you know of the great work that he's done for, for, for many, many years, several decades now. Uh, he's currently serving as a Deputy Director of Research Translation in the Office of Smoking and Health and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, but uh, he, he's been very active in tobacco control, knows a lot. I'm not going to spend much more time because I want to hear what he has to say. Uh, although I will say I had dinner with him last night and learned that uh, he was uh, 
he grew up in Flatonia, Texas. For all the Texas people in the audience today, um, he's a Texas boy, so he's done well. And thank you very much, Terry. I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here with you, and I am going to try to give you a quick overview of something that uh, many of you are trying to figure out, as we are in public health trying to figure out what to do with these new products. And the title tells you a hint. We consider it risky business in dealing with these new products, and I'll tell you a bit why. But before we go to these new products, let's recognize one fundamental fact. Tobacco smoke is deadly. Exposure to tobacco smoke causes disease throughout the body. And in our recent re Surgeon General report of 2014, the major conclusion was that this disease, death, and burden from exposure to tobacco smoke will only end when we can rapidly eliminate the use of the combusted tobacco products. Now, a question underneath that is, what will move us toward that goal and if these new products will help or hurt us? I am going to talk about these new products under the label of electronic nicotine delivery devices. That's a broader title. And why are we using that title? Uh, we use that title because the products vary greatly, and I'm going to go over that. We're going to talk about who is using these products, and then we're going to talk about how the products could help in overall tobacco control, and what policies CDC and government and public health should be looking at that's appropriate for bringing these products uh, into the marketplace. First of all, electronic cigarettes and vaping devices vary greatly. We title them electronic nicotine delivery systems because they are drug delivery devices. Now they vary greatly from disposable to rechargeable to what we talk about as tanks or that have a pool of liquid that is heated and used, and then what is called novelty, which wide, ranges widely. And some people call our, our uh, electronic hookahs and other many types of things that they, they talk about. Bottom line, all of these products can or do primarily deliver vaporized nicotine, which is brought by some kind of carrier aerosol, propylene glycocol or other types of things. And also they have a lot of flavorings, and we'll talk about that. So many people will hear that these products are better, but let's remember one fact. They are a tobacco product, and they are not just harmless water vapor. And they contain many other compounds besides nicotine, and because they're unregulated, we don't know what is in most of them. And the little testing that has been done has found some levels of really dangerous things. Now, are the levels as high as cigarettes? By and large, no. But when you're watching out for dangerous pesticides or things and washing your vegetables or you generally don't want to put a, a dangerous chemical in your body, even small amounts are worth knowing about when you're choosing to do something. Additionally, these products can be altered easily, particularly the tank systems, to deliver other psychoactive substances. I am not going to give you the cue of how to find all of this, but I have a have news for you. For adolescents know where they are. They know where to find the information about this. Ask them. They'll tell you. So why are we watching out for this? It started out a few years ago as more of a fad, but now there are over 466 brands with over almost 8,000 unique flavors with a wide range of, of, of marketing groups and groups that are selling it, making it from the 
the large tobacco companies all the way down to mom and pop shops on the corner. But the biggest overriding fact about this whole market is it's unregulated. Some of the people in, in public health call it the Wild West of tobacco products. All you need to do is open your door and say, I'm selling. You don't have to have any kind of regulation about what you're selling, where you're buying it, is it containing something that may even be very dangerous. All that is possible. That's what unregulated means. And how big is this market? Well, one way of looking at the size of the market is the level of advertising. And it's been shooting up dramatically. It's gone up about threefold from 2011 through 2012. And our original, our basic estimate for last year, 2013, where we don't have the, all the data in, that it went up again, almost fourfold, up to over $80 million of advertising. Now, in respect to a lot of consumer products, this is not a huge amount of money, but it's a fact of how rapidly this number is increasing and the content of what is in these advertising. And we're going to talk about that. They, the companies are following a path of doing what tobacco companies have done for 100 years. First of all, they're using celebrity spokespersons. On one side, you see the e-cigarette ad. On the other side, an old-style tobacco ad. I'm going to show you a few more examples of this. This is the type that we really know is bad. The Marlboro Man was the classic example of what maintained the attractiveness of cigarettes in youth to smoking. And guess what? A newer version of the rugged man is showing up in the e-cigarettes. And even worse, we've got the glamorous woman. What does a teenage boy look for when he's flipping through a magazine? The things that, that are titillating. And guess what? The, the blue cigarette ads you see is, all, is not the worst. There are a lot more egregious types of examples of this. Like sex appeal. So we have glamorous women, but then we put them in more sexualized situations. This is something that tobacco companies have done for decades, and boy, are the new products jumping on the bandwagon. So why is this so important? Because in a 2012 Certain General Report, we looked at what works. We have over 100 years of studying the bad behavior of the tobacco industry, and we know from all of that pattern what is enticing to the young people, to the adolescents and particularly. And guess what? They're doing the same patterns in the e-cigarette advertisements. They're following the same themes, and then they're doing price promotions and other kind of inducements. They're working very hard with the policymakers saying that, oh, we're better than tobacco products. We have to be sold everywhere. And there's even uh, things that I'm not showing you that you go down to your convenience store. Where are these things showing up? next to candy, next to the other kind of eye-catching products. And not only are they next to candy, they're flavored to taste like candy. Guess what? The people who are selling this say that this makes it more attractive to adults. Well, tobacco companies told us that for decades. We don't care about the, the fact that this is uh, looks like it's targeted children. We don't sell the children until we got the secret documents that showed that not only do they plan to sell the children, but their whole marketing plan is built upon their ability to have replacement smokers. These companies are following the same pattern. So what what is happening? Well, some people say that the numbers that I'm that are up on here are not so big. In comparison to tobacco use rates, they are smaller. But as of 2012, the most published data, the 2013 is in, in process is starting to come out, we're already up to 10% of high school students who have ever tried this, uh, these types of wide ranging of the products. And it's continued doubling. The most recent publications showed data from Europe where the rates of use in high school students were already up to 40%. So this we are afraid and are highly uh, predictive that these rates are only heading up. How much they jump from the blue to the gold, we're afraid they're heading that same way and keep jumping in 13 and 14 in the years to come. And even more concerning, while these percentages are low, 
there are more and more youth who are using it regularly. Now, even worse, though, not only are they using the e-cigarette regularly, but most of them are also blending the use of the e-cigarette with a cigarette. So sometimes they're smoking cigarettes, and sometimes they're using these other products. And the fact that these things are moving up at a fast pace is concerning. Now, people say, well, but these products don't have as many dangerous chemicals. But let's remember something that was been published in the last two Surgeon General reports, the 2012 and the 2014 Surgeon General report. Nicotine is highly addictive, and its use by adolescents can have lasting effects. One of the effects is that it can damage the developing brain. Now, how many parents would be happy with their with uh, uh, 130,000 students uh, in middle school using a compound that is damaging their brains? Does it need to be more than two or three? 100,000 is a bad number to me. And half a million, when you count up all of the uh, kids in school, half a million kids using something that is damaging their brain, I consider a problem. So, the rate of use among uh, the school use kids has continuing to go up. And one of the things that we're seeing is that many of the kids who might not have been using cigarettes are using the e-cigarettes. And what we're seeing in the data is that these never smoking kids, these are kids who have never even taken a puff off of a cigarette, that we got a quarter million of them that are using e-cigarettes and most of them are expressing in the surveys, our school-based surveys, the kind of attitudes that show that they have an intention uh, to try cigarettes. Now, as I just told you, these e-cigarettes can get them addicted on nicotine. One of the horrible facts of life is that the cigarette companies have spent uh, the last hundred years perfecting the quality of the cigarette as a drug delivery device. Nothing gives you a better brain hit of nicotine than the cigarette. And if you start liking nicotine by this e-cigarette, guess what? You may move on to the best drug delivery device of nicotine that exists, and that's the cigarette. So that's the youth issues. But we also are seeing a dramatic pattern in adults, and the patterns are going up dramatically. So what you see here is by 2013, over 80% of adults were aware of the e-cigarette. Now, the rates of current use were only about 8.5%. This is an interesting number, uh, and some people say that this is good news, that these people are using e-cigarettes instead of smoking cigarettes, and that we'll talk more about that. But one of the things to, to recognize is that despite that 80% of the smokers have tried these uh, e-cigarettes or are aware of them, only a small percentage are actually using them. Guess what? This is proof positive of what I was talking about. The cigarette is still the best drug delivery device, and these people are trying the e-cigarette, hoping that they might be competitive with the with the uh, classic cigarette as a drug delivery device. They try it, find that it doesn't work as good, and go back to the cigarette. And we're supposed to look at that pattern and not be concerned about youth. Wow, I don't I don't think this is good news. It's saying that the e-cigarette is trendy and something people are trying. But the, the addicts out there, the, the over 40 million adult addicts, say that it ain't the best delivery device, that they still prefer the cigarette. So we're addicting youth and putting them into the pipeline toward the same kind of pattern of behavior. Now, uh, in all of this, one of the things that also concerns us is these little uh, golden bars at the bottom. Now, these are small, but these are farmer smokers who are coming back in who are relapsing back to nicotine addiction. Now, one of the things that we look at this, so these numbers are small, but remember, people are fighting to stay off of an addiction that had, they may have had eight or 10 quit attempts before they successfully quit cigarettes. And if this is something that lures that back into smoking, it's bad news too. So, can these new products have a negative or positive impact on this is kind of techie talk, individual or population health. What that means is, well, it might help the one person, but if it's hurting, hurting three people for the one person it hurts, it's having a negative population impact. So what's the balance between helping somebody and hurting a lot? What we know is that the potential of these things having a good effect in the overall population of people is that 
is going to happen where we're in an environment where the appeal, accessibility, promotion, and use of cigarettes and other combusted products are rapidly reduced and eliminated. As long as the cigarette market is out there, and as long as this highly efficient drug delivery device of the cigarette is out there, we are afraid about the ability to get the potential benefits if these uh, electronic cigarettes could be a good news. One of the things is that the, these overall, these electronic products have the potential for harm, and I've been saying this, and now let me review the kind of the basics. First of all, they can expose children and adolescents to this harmful uh, compound, not only directly, but because these products are being promoted as things to do uh, in where you can't smoke. By the companies, we can have secondhand exposure of children, adolescents, pregnant women, and non-smokers to a neurotoxin, which is nicotine, that can cause brain damage. I don't want my sons in a situation where they're being exposed to something that is going to damage their brains. Do you? I think this is a concern. While people say that it's no problem, it's just aerosol, no, it's not just aerosol. The second big problem, these products are unregulated, and they're put out in a marketplace and sold to people without warnings. The data I'm going to show you about poisoning is really scary. Uh, the rate of young children and toddlers and small kids who are seeing a bottle that is labeled bubble gum or is labeled candy, it's actually a bottle of nicotine, and guess what? The flavoring uh, name is striking to them, the coloring is striking to them, and they drink it. Well, we'll talk about that in the next slide. But overall, in, uh, the direct harm can come from the uncertain effects of the long-term use. Even if people switch completely from cigarettes, we're, the, the burden of, of toxins that you get from these things may be lower, but we don't fully understand the long-term risk yet. Now, here's poisoning data. That dash line on the top is the cigarettes. And there's actually a lot of poisoning coming or going on from cigarettes. Toddlers will find a pack of cigarettes and eat the cigarette. Uh, it's, as crazy as that sounds, but if you have a toddler, you understand that they'll eat almost anything if it, if it looks different or, you know, they, they'll try it. But the blue line is the scary line. Look at how it's going up uh, since the start of 2012 up through 2014, and it's continued to go up. Uh, these data are, are only in, uh, through early 2000, uh, 2014. Poisoning of, uh, have, these poisonings have not produced a fatality yet. But unregulated availability of this liquid nicotine all over the place is a disaster waiting to happen. Are we going to wait to regulate these things until we see the dead children in the ER rooms? I hope not. So, beyond the direct effect of the e-cigarettes, we also have the potential harm that over 70% of the people using these products are also smoking. What we're most afraid of is that the people who might have quit because smoking is becoming less convenient. They can't smoke in indoor places. Their friends and relatives don't want them to smoke around them. They're not allowed to smoke in their house. Are now shifting to e-cigarettes to get their nicotine dose when they can't smoke cigarettes. This is one of the things that we are studying, but we're already seeing a lot of red flags that the e-cigarette can delay people in quitting completely. And guess what? If it delays only a few of the smokers so that a few totally quit and a few delay, the balance can very quickly be negative overall. Those of you who have successfully switched to e-cigarettes will holler at me and say, it's saving my life. And I say, thank you. I'm glad that it is. But guess what? If the pattern of use overall is killing some of your neighbors, we need to be concerned about that. And we're not going to try to take these products away from you that they're helping you quit, but we're also going to try to keep them from having farmer shoppers relax, having more youth use them, and then this bottom bullet, 
One of the things that we know is that if we keep glamorizing and renormalizing tobacco use, it makes it much harder to eliminate this inherently deadly product, cigarettes. Now, people are talking about that it's a successful quit device, but guess what? The evidence is quite mixed. We know from anecdotal information and talking to individual smokers that some people are using it to help them quit. But when you look at the overall population and when we're looking at large groups of people that, are, that have used them, by and large, they're not that much better than the FDA-approved nicotine replacement therapies. Now, here's some studies that, that it might be helpful, okay? So there's six studies that say it might be helpful. But there's five studies that say it's not helpful. So that's, I call that mixed data. I saw, I, is it possible that overall we can make the e-cigarette helpful in helping people quit? Maybe, but we have to figure that out. How it's being marketed now and how it's being used now is quite uncertain if it's really going to help most people who are trying them and to help them quit. So we need to recognize that there are ways that we can end the epidemic of tobacco. And one of the ways is really clamping down on the traditional cigarette, reducing the nicotine content of it, setting stricter standards. But additionally, we need local restrictions on these products, all products, the cigarette and the e-cigarette. All of this we know are part of the way that we'll end the scenario. The end, end game of ending the epidemic of tobacco-related disease can happen with or without the e-cigarette in these end products. But there are at least three scenarios in which they might help. If they are uh, sold and used in a fashion that promotes complete long-term substitution, so that smokers are completely substituting them, that could be good. And if the availability makes it easier for the policymakers to say that we need to end the combusted products and make them basically unavailable or, or hardly available, that could be good. But in all of this right now, the main thing that they're, they're being promoted for is, to, is that they will help people quit smoking, and that is maybe. So... Right now, the two biggest ways they can help in solving the, the health problem of cigarettes are not happening, and the third one is only a maybe. So, what should we be saying in this, in this state of uncertainty? First of all, Congress has written letters to FDA, public health groups have, have written letters, we've got some of the documents that are available on the background resources for this webinar. We need to do something. Is it by congressional legislation or by FDA regulation or by any of these? But we, marketing and sales to youth cannot be tolerated. Additionally, many of us in public health are saying that the e-cigarettes should be prohibited in all places where smoking is inhibited. And in this whole process, we need to use this e-cigarette, like these last slides said, in ways to eliminate combusted tobaccos. FDA regulation is fundamental. We all need to be writing and supporting FDA and their ability to, to get control over these products. But Satan's communities can have action as well. So right now there is an FDA pr proposed rule. I'm not going to go through it all. It's all in the kind of legal world of regulation. But fundamentally they're trying to extend the, the kind of restrictions we have on cigarettes to all of these new products and, and basically bring them under a reasonable regulation about so we know what is in there and we, that, that people are able to buy with some knowledge about what is in these products. Secondly, state and communities can really do a lot. You know, it is not only a federal problem. Most of you believe that you want to make your own choices, you want to make your own choices in the community, and local control of everything always works better than control at the, from the top down. We need clean air. You need to make decisions about where these e-cigarettes are allowed. You need to recognize that they're not only delivering nicotine, but your kids are learning how to deliver many other psychoactive compounds in these products. It's a wild west out there in terms of what these products are and in terms of the ability of, to control them. In addition, there's a product, the sales of these things are so unregulated that there's this risk of poisoning and other types of problems. So basically, there's no evidence that public use 
of these e-cigarettes is necessary to help smokers switch. If anything, it may lead to dual use and slow down their ability to quit. So beyond the local actions, there's also state actions. The minority laws and the access laws that already exist on tobacco products are under state control. You can do things. You don't need FDA. Additionally, you need to look at your clean indoor air laws. They're clean indoor air. Let's pay attention to that term, clean. Let's keep our air clean. There's no reason to, uh, to pollute it with a neurotoxin nicotine. Additionally, there's a lots of other strategies that you can do in terms of licensing, marketing, taxation, and all of these kinds of things we're starting to track in, in our uh, website. We'll try to help you in terms of uh, the types of options that are available that you can do. All of this is feeding to the fact that in, all of these strategies are, are only part of what has to be a global strategy of ending combusted tobacco. We know what works. All of these new things of regulating the e-cigarette and handling it should not distract us from the fact that comprehensive statewide programs, media campaigns, excise taxes, broadening the availability of proven cessation strategies and getting cessation into primary and specialty care are things that work. We can add these new strategies of in game that may involve the regulation of the product and the change in how we're handling of many of these new products to amplify those strategies, but the proven things still need to be done in really good ways. One of the takeaways in all of this that I want you to pay attention to, these new products are not safe. They might be less dangerous than the cigarette, but guess what? The cigarette is incredibly dangerous. Being a little bit better in it is not good enough. The analogy is that if jumping out of the 10th floor will kill you, jumping out of the 7th floor ain't a whole lot better. Just remember that you need to be walking out the front door, not jumping out of the 3rd or 4th floor. Until we know what floor the e-cigarettes are on, let's be a little bit careful. One of the things is that we have an unregulated marketing and sales distribution. Whatever we can do while FDA is coming up to full power, we've got to do it at the local and state level. Additionally, if these companies want to promote it as a cessation device, go to the FDA and get approval of it as a cessation device. There's a route for doing that, and they aren't doing it. Why? So the potential for harm and benefit depends on the whole context of how these products are used in con conjunction with the combusted, most deadly cigarettes. While we're getting that whole Wild West under control, we need to all be talking about no marketing to our children. We need to keep our air clean, and we need to do the things that we know work of this comprehensive approach of the statewide programs, the, uh, the clean indoor air standards, the price increases, the hard-hitting media camp uh, campaigns. we got to keep the pedal to the metal on those things to eliminate combusted tobacco. If we eliminated combusted tobacco and they were almost unavailable, guess what? The e-cigarette would have a potential of maybe having a much better effect. But let's get rid of the combusted tobacco as we're figuring out what to do with these new products. Thank you. Well, Dr. Prohacek, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, and uh, we've, we've definitely had some questions coming in here, and I encourage everyone to continue to type in their questions, um, and we'll let those come in here, but we'll kick off here with a question from Erin Mead, um, and she says, the configuration of the e-cigarette uh, has changed a lot over time uh, through the different generations, moving from siga like to mid-size, pen-like to tank systems, uh, tank-style advanced versions. Do you think that, uh, A, certain types are being targeted to youth, and B, the evolution of style over time indicates that the companies are trying to target established adult smokers and getting away from targeting youth. Uh, well, first of all, there's a wide range of products, and there's a, a and the, the fact the fact that they that some groups uh, uh, there's large segments of this, and some are trying to act responsibly. But the fact is that the the biggest entry into the marketplace is the tobacco industry. If you look at the products. Uh, the range of products being sold by the main tobacco companies, they are being created to be attractive to youth and are doing the most egregious advertising. While there are small vape shops that are trying to act responsibly, uh, you have to realize that you're being flooded out by this wide range of other activity by the established tobacco companies. Great. Um, this one here uh, is from Alma Ochoa. 
Uh, for nonprofit organizations that want to follow safer protocol and regulations regarding hens, where can we look for example policies? Uh, there are uh, uh, links on our website. There's also the Public Health Law Center. Uh, if you, uh, uh, we will uh, will uh, work with the uh, TCOR here of getting some of these websites out and posted on some of the things. Public Health Law sites are, are very good at that and provide very detailed information to you. Excellent. Yeah, and we'll, uh, if we get those links, we'll put them out on the Twitter feed as well through our uh, Texas TCOR's handle. You can see there on your screen. Uh, this this other one from Alice uh, says. Uh, what will it take to regulate marketing techniques used by tobacco uh, and ENDS companies? Ultimately, it'll take FDA, but it also uh, you know, can be congressional action. There can be a variety of things. Uh, and one of the things is that uh, always look at locally. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, reality of tobacco regulation is that there is a clause in the uh, uh, new legislation that gives the uh, state and communities control over time, place, and manner. That's a legalistic term. Time, place, and manner in which any of these products are sold. You have control. Think alcohol. We have dry counties. Think, think alcohol in terms of how hard liquor versus beer is handled in licensing and differential. Uh, these products are under your control. You do have legal authority over time, place, and manner. And the, uh, I won't go into all these details because the websites can go into a lot of these details, but remember, you have the right to protect your children, and you have the ability to do a lot more than you may know. Great. Um, this question comes from Daniel Kreitzberg. Um, he says, uh, I'm curious if there are any other countries we can look to to emulate in their approach to big tobacco and these new alternative tobacco products. Uh, well, there really are, and there's some great examples, and the U.S. is falling way behind. In terms of uh, of large scale kind of policy action, Australia is probably one of the places. Australia, and New Zealand are way out in front, and they already banned the e-cigarette. And they also have banned the basic uh, uh, promotion of cigarettes. They've gone to what is called plain packaging. So cigarettes have to be in an ugly green package, and the only thing that is on the package is warning labels. Many of the uh, over 20, I think it maybe I'm low now. It's over 30 countries have graphic warning labels on their tobacco products that are ex very extreme. So uh, the reality is that a lot of these companies are uh, countries are recognizing that the cigarette is inherently a dangerous product that kills half of its users when used as intended, and that they're therefore going to crack down on it. But they're also aware that nicotine is a neurotoxin dangerous drug and they're treating it that way. So there's a lot of parts of the world who are, are, are way ahead of us on this. Great. And um, this one's from Casey Hansen. Uh, she says, you talk uh, about regulation from local to state to federal levels. Who do you recommend people contact for e-cigarette regulations at local levels? We'll, we'll give you the, the, the websites that public health law centers have, and uh, there's a consortium of public health law uh, consortium that really has done a great job and has some great handouts and materials on this. Excellent. Um, and I, I want to uh, also open it up. I know uh, we have Dr. Kelder on, on the line as well. If he has any questions that he wants to ask um, at this time while, while we let other questions come in. Uh, thanks, Brooks. I, I don't have a question per se, but I just want to let all the listeners know out there that uh, and sometime in the spring and summer of uh, 2015, we're going to be launching a new uh, T-Cores website that will try and uh, aggregate lots of different information. And not only just our T-Course Center will be engaging in professional development just like this, where you can get answers to your questions, um, but all the other centers are too. So we're, we're working now to organize the 14 centers to put you know, the information that Terry's talking about, some of the information that's at the CDC, the FDA, the NCI websites to make it easy, to make it uh, friendly, and to continue with these efforts of uh, putting on webinars and hosting speakers in the future. Great. We're definitely looking forward to that website. Um, we'll take this last question here, and if we didn't get your question, um, we will we'll try to follow up with you via email, um, or you can uh, reach out to us on Twitter or uh, through the website there. But this last one is just um, wondering if you have any dual uh, any data that is on dual use of cigarillos and e-cigarettes, uh, and if so, can you speak to that? Uh, we actually put out uh, a couple of publications. We can post uh, those in terms of uh, what the patterns of use are, uh, uh, both in youth, in our uh, National Youth Tobacco Survey, as well as health styles. Um, yes, 
there is a pattern of general dual use. Uh, it's more with cigarettes than cigar cigarillos and cigars. Uh, and there's a, 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 diff a really differential patterns in crumbs of uh, parts of the country and different racial ethnic groups. Um, but uh, uh, the youth who are trying the e-cigarettes are by and large are trying multiple things. We find that on average, the adolescent who is trying products is trying three or four different things. So they're they're using uh, uh, the uh, cigarellos, the cigarettes, smoking occasional cigarettes, using the uh, e-cigarettes. They're uh, they're they're playing with everything, and playing with fire. It sounds like too. So well, I I, I want to thank everyone for um, attending our webinar today. Uh, it is, it is uh, has been recorded, and we will make sure to put it online on the T Cores website. You can see there Texas T Cores. Dot org. Uh, we will get that up uh, next week. Uh, but thank you all so much. Uh, if we didn't get your question, we'll try to answer it uh, on a one-on-one -on -one level. Uh, and a big thank you again to Dr. Pahacek for being our guest today. Thank you all so much and have a great uh, weekend.